I suppose we were talking a little bit earlier about, about what it is that brings us all together here. And I think it's a particular focus on Belfast and also on womanhood in all of its various states. So what we're going to do is I will introduce our three writers um, and then we're going to hear some readings and then afterwards we'll have some discussion and hopefully at the end we will have time for some questions for the audience. So start thinking about those now. You know, this is your job. <coughs> Don't even pay attention. Just think of the questions for the end. But we'd love to have them, so that would be wonderful. Um, so I'm going to introduce our readers in alphabetical order, starting with Lucy Caldwell. Lucy is the award-winning author of four novels, several stage plays and radio dramas, and two collections of short stories, Multitudes from Faber in 2016 and Intimacies from Faber in 2021. Her most recent novel, These Days, was published by Faber in March 22 and won the 2023 Walter Scott Prize for Historical Fiction. Wendy Erskine's debut short story collection, Sweet Home, was published by the Stinging Fly Press and Picador. It was shortlisted for the Republic of Consciousness Prize and the Edge Hill Prize and longlisted for the Gordon Byrne Prize. It won the Butler Literary Prize and was optioned for TV. Her new collection, Dance Move, was published in 2022 by Stinging Fly and Picador. Mathematics was shortlisted for the short story of the year at the 2022 Irish Book Awards. And finally, Rosemary Jenkinson is a playwright and short story writer from Belfast. She was the 2017 Artist in Residence in the Lyric Theatre and received a major Individual Artist Award from the Arts Council of Northern Ireland in 2019. Recent plays include Silent Trade, May the Road Rise Up and Dream, Sleep and Connect. Recent short story collections include Catholic Boy, which was shortlisted for the EU Prize for Literature, Marching Season and Love in the Time of Chaos, which was published this year by Ireland House. So, Lucy, would you mind kicking us off with a reading, please? Yeah, of course. Thank you, um, Jessica. And thank you all for coming here today. I was going to read something from um, these days, but for the week that is in it, there is only one other thing that I could read. Um, it will explain itself as I read it. It's from uh, my collection, Intimacies, and um, it's from a story called Words for Things. While my husband was gone, I texted a new name to my friend, Anna Nicole Smith. We'd spent the afternoon sending names back and forth. Tonya Harding, Amy Winehouse, Shannon Doherty, Britney Spears. Because the thing was, it wasn't just Monica Lewinsky. It was all the other women too, who used to be sort of laughing stocks and who you suddenly realised turned out to be something else entirely. Once you started Googling, it was hard to stop. Anna Nicole Smith's son, Daniel, I now newly knew, died suddenly in her room in hospital while visiting her and her new baby, his half-sister. The toxicology report suggested he'd ingested some of her methadone prescription along with other medication. At his funeral, she made them open the coffin and tried to climb inside. She begged them to bury her with him. He was 20. She was only 38. She died of an overdose herself a few months later. Good one, my friend messaged back. A moment later, she texted, Jade Goody. Jade Goody, I replied. My friend sent the hand painting its nails. How could we not have known? I wanted to text, but I couldn't think of the right emoji to make it funny. You knew and didn't know. Sometimes it seemed that all of my life had been knowing and not knowing, as if it was a technique rather than a state, a safety mode, a way of coping. There were words for things now that we hadn't even realised were things because there were no words for them. Do you remember, I said to my husband when he came back, Sinead O'Connor ripping up the picture of the Pope? Vaguely, he said, not really. Here, look, I said, and I found it on my phone. She'd been performing on the American programme Saturday Night Live. In rehearsal, she'd held up a picture of orphan children we have confidence in the victory of good over evil. But when she did it live, the picture was of Pope John Paul II and she ripped it up once, twice, three times and scattered the pieces. Fight the real enemy, she said, looking straight at the camera. The clip ended with her taking off her headset and blowing out the church pillar candles on the table beside her. We watched those 29 seconds again and again. Every time you felt something creeping up and down your spine. Bloody hell, my husband said. I can't believe you don't remember that, I said. 
maybe it wasn't such a big deal in England. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> Wendy, will you read for us? Please? I will indeed. Thank you. Thanks very much. It's lovely to be here. And I'm going to read a little bit of a story called Secrets Beneath a Beach, Crystal Cancun. I'm reading from the middle of it. And it's about a woman called Linda who's divorced from her husband, although she still really loves her husband. And she has a takeaway meal every Friday night with her friend Ray. One evening when Linda was round at Ray's, Ray said that Linda should maybe make other plans for the next week because she wasn't going to be around. What do you mean? Linda asked. I'm not going to be here and meeting somebody. <laughs> what do you mean? What do you mean, what do you mean? I'm meeting somebody for a drink. It's not against the law. On a Friday night, you'll find, Linda, that the town is full of people meeting up for a drink <laughs> on a Friday night. Well, yeah. So I'm going for a drink. Nothing major. Just going to see how it goes. So, it, so it's that kind of drink, Linda said. A drink's a drink, it's just with somebody I've been talking to online. That Ray talked to guys online seemed quite incredible. You'll need to be careful, won't you? Why is that? Do you not read the papers? <laughs> I don't think I need to worry, Linda. I contacted him online, but I didn't meet him online. Knew him from years ago, we used to work together. I thought you said that all the guys you work with are next to useless. <laughs> We're not going to be working on Friday night. <laughs> well, Linda said, just as long as you know what you're doing. I do. That's good then. Ray put her plate down. Mike's like you, she said, divorced. Plenty of us around. Plenty of you around making money for all the lawyers. The only man that Linda ever looked for on the internet was her ex-husband. She searched for him every few days. There was another Richie Hart who lived in Cumbria and who did hill walking, half marathons for charity. She'd grown used to seeing his fresh and beaming face as he crossed another finish line. <laughs> Linda was mostly relieved when she didn't see the sharp features of the one she was looking for or didn't come across his name in any newspaper's court reports. But when he appeared in none of her trolls, she was also disappointed. A brown envelope with their respective solicitor's letters was still about somewhere in the house. His woman's had the line drawing of the Georgian windows at the top. Her man's one involved a configuration of semicircles and triangles. When they split up, a person at work asked gently, did he have an affair? Oh, wasn't it? An affair would have made it easier because she could have felt personally and particularly wronged. No, he, he wasn't ever violent towards me. She'd also had to say, I've just had enough, really. Enough of what? <laughs> just enough. <laughs> there was a procession of jobs lost, loans not paid, cars crashed, and all the time that Kit Kat attitude. A week into another job that he could do standing on his head, Richie said that the boss gave him a hard time for eating a Twix when he was at his desk. You don't eat until the break, he warned. I wasn't eating a Twix, said Richie. The boss said, well, I saw you. No, you didn't, Richie said. You need to get your facts straight. You didn't see me eating a Twix, you saw me eating a Kit Kat. <laughs> <laughs> the last time Linda saw Richie, she brought him three bags of shopping, which included a couple of packets of Kit Kats. It was back when she knew where he was, when he was still in the flat he'd moved into, the one that overlooked the football pitch. The smell of churned up mud always seemed to hang in the air, even when the ground was frozen solid. When they answered the door, she saw he had the dregs of a black eye. What happened to you? Linda asked. Oh, don't remember. Don't remember. Could have, could have been one of several different things. You're not working at the moment? Just looking around, seeing how things lie. You've got thin, Linda said. He asked how Danny was. He's fine, the big 18 coming up. Can you believe it, Richie? Sure cannot. Well, you're not going to make me a cup of tea then? He didn't have any tea bags. The fridge had nothing in it but a bottle of lemonade. Maybe you come round, you know, when it's his birthday, Linda said. Could do he said, if he wants me round. But I was thinking of getting away for a bit, maybe got an offer of job in, in Wales, maybe. Don't know. 
When Linda left, instead of driving home, she took a detour to a shop where she bought stuff she thought he would use, Kit Kats included. When he opened the door again to the surprise of seeing her standing there a second time, she said, here's a few things to keep you going. She had practiced saying it as she walked towards the flat, so it sounded quite matter of fact and cheerful. Linda, he said. I'll leave it there. Okay. Okay, yeah, uh, this is my play, Silent Trid, and unlike Wendy, I'm not so comfortable doing the dialogue, particularly as one of the main characters is a Nigerian woman, and that would be horrible if I was going to read that. So I've just done, I cobbled together something. This is from Rab, and Rab is a brothel owner in Belfast, and he's basically telling Precious, the Nigerian, what's going to happen. Okay, so here we go. Here you go. A couple of chill pills will ease you all into this. Now for the house rules. Look at me, right into the peepers, because this is important. You try to escape, you bang on the door, bang on the window. You do anything to alert the outside to this house. You are titty bread. You remember the coronavirus lockdown? Well, do you? Perfect training for this, a total lock-in. And don't even think if you do get out, you won't be deported. Once you're over 18, you're flying back to Nigeria in cuffs. You think they want some scuzzy prosy over here? Sure, Joseph told me you can't even read. So who's going to employ you apart from yours truly? You should look on this as an opportunity. First thing, you are safe as houses here. Safe as a safe house even. No punter will lay a finger on you because Bap will break him fingers. Second, you pay me back for taking you in and pay off your visa. A couple of years, you'll be home in a boat, free woman, out in the tear. You got your whole life ahead of you. You're a wee ba. Sure, your shite's yellow. Jeez, you should have seen me at 26. I was a waster. Now I got three gaffes and 15 girls to my name, and that's just the start of my empire. Could be the same for you. All you have to do is be kind to the poor, sad fuckers who have to come here for a ride, most of them trapped at home with their boring partners looking for you to give them the thrill of their lives. It's your privilege to tend to them. You're their nurse, their bartender, their minister, their servant. Always remember, it's own, a poor rabbit only has one hole. And what's the hygiene? Give that bed another wee spray, would you? That's it. Thank you all so much for that. Um, and I, I suppose, you know, the things that, that tie us together here, I suppose, apart from me, I'm a Dubliner, are the connections with Belfast and writing about women, writing about contemporary and historical Belfast. Um, and Rosemary, I think, I think yours is a portrait of a, of a contemporary Belfast that most people won't have seen before. Um, Silent Trade is a play about, about trafficking. Um, and I, I read it and I thought, I, you know, I found myself very shocked at the idea that in a city the size of Belfast or any Irish city on the island of Ireland, that something like this could be going on behind the scenes. Um, and then I felt very naive for being shocked by that in a sense. But, um, but what kind of brought you to the, the topic in the first place? Yeah, uh, it was 2019. There was a huge case in Belfast with a... Um, a Nigerian um, human trafficking victim and it was all coming out right then and it, it, she was subsequently the one who was the first um, the first sort of uh, or the, her oppressors were the first people who were uh, convicted of human trafficking in Belfast so it was a huge case mm -hmm. and of course at that time it was 2019 it was Ghislaine Maxwell and Epstein. So that was like huge. I mean, it was just all kicking off. And mm. I mean, I even noticed this week, um, th there's another Romanian ring in Belfast or, uh, and Northern Ireland um, trafficking from, from the, su the south, north. Mm. So, I mean, it is a huge, it's a huge thing. And I, I obviously talked to Nigerians about this um, who worked in the community and 
So it, it was, I chose Nigeria really because of that huge case, but really I could have chosen anything. But I, I'd already done a play actually called Lives and Translation, and it was about a Somali asylum seeker. So I kind of wanted to, I really liked Africa. Mm -hmm. I, you know, it's fascinating to me and exotic as well. So that really, yeah, so. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's interesting, I mean, we see the, 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 I suppose, the darkest side of, of women's experience in, in your play. Um, but Lucy, even in the extract you read there, there's something fascinating about the idea that, you know, there is that darker side of things. And then there are the women we don't take seriously, the women we laugh at, the women we give ourselves permission to find ridiculous. Um, talk to me a little bit about that. I found that fascinating. Yeah, that story starts... Um with two young mothers who've just come out of a baby swimming class mm -hmm. um, discussing Monica Lewinsky. Yeah. And they realise the story opens with them discussing how shocked they are to find that she was only 22. Oh, you know, yeah. she was 22, mm. so, so young. Mm. And um, I don't think, you know, motherhood for me, I'd always been terrified of that, you know, thing of the pram in the hallway. Mm. I'd always wanted to have children my whole life. Um, I'd always been terrified that as soon as I had children, it would be the end of my artistic life. Yeah. Um, you know, that thing that I'd internalise. I'm so interested in these, almost, you know, these, these software programs that are on our hardware without our permission, you know, yeah. that we can, we can get rid of. And for me, that um, pram in the hallway was, was a big one because um, I started writing in my own voice. I started writing my best writing when I had children. Yeah. Um, and also what motherhood was for me was, I don't think you need to be a mother to have this, but it was very helpful for me to have one of those sort of pivotal moments where you can reassess um, the place and time that you grew up in and the way that you were brought up in mm. as you're wondering, how are you going to bring your children up? And um, for me, it was one of those things where I suddenly started thinking about, um, you know, Monica Lewinsky. I suddenly started um, reconsidering those women. I remembered... I was 11 at the time that um, Sinead O'Connor ripped up that picture of the Pope. Yeah. And I didn't understand it, but I remember being so fascinated by it. And I remember the furore in the papers, people saying that she was um, doing sympathetic magic in an attempt, <laughs> one cardinal said, you know. Why and so this, this idea of witchcraft. Magic. And the, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so I was, and I always, I've been thinking in recent days again of um, that kind of gift of psychic freedom that mm, I think mm -hmm. she gave to so many girls and young women, especially at the place and time that we were growing up in. And for me, um, you know, the stories that I write tend to be um, maybe untold or undertold experiences. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of those, of course, tend to be, tend to be female yeah. um even with with my novel these days mm. you know people quite often just one of the ways of women's writing is dismissed is it's dismissed as domestic but i think who doesn't live their life at a domestic scale man or woman i know you like know men just don't go into houses you know <laughs> yeah. such a, i mean I, I find that really fascinating that idea of the domestic sphere as if you know we leave them out in the back garden the whole time yeah. you know? <laughs> but you know i think it does no one a disservice because of course men have domestic lives of mm -hmm. course mm -hmm. men have you know so I think it's it's that's one of the things I find fascinating yeah yeah and um, what you said there about psychic freedom actually made me think of a lot of the women in your stories Wendy whereby you know I, I have rereading them again I, I, I'm always I'm so drawn into the the kind of the very close third person narrative or that first person narrative as well but there seems to be a dynamic a lot with the women in story in your stories um, and particularly in let me see in dance move actually I was rereading that mm -hmm. and to to all their Jews from from sweet home that women have internalized a certain way of being or a certain ideas about a way to live and um, that kind of stymies their happiness a little mm -hmm. bit I would argue that yeah, I, I, I think so. So there's in, in my in my stories there's there's lots of people that have had things happen to them mm -hmm. in the past that in some way affect how they exist in the present, but that's not a gender specific thing. Yeah. I mean that that's something as well that happens to to, to men too. Mm. And so in the stories it's just as frequently really that there are also men, you know, in that story that I've just read, Richie. Richie's unable to hold down a, a job. He can't really cope with relationships because of something that happened to him as a teenage boy. Um, 
And so that has impinged really on his life ever, mm -hmm. ever since. So, you know, I do write about guys like that, but I also write about a lot of, a lot of, a lot of women like that. Mm -hmm. And that story, Dan Smooth, that actually the, the collection got its name from, um, it started off as one, so it's, it's about this woman and she's watching her daughter dancing. Um, with her friend mm. and she's kind of quite appalled by it because it's really sex quite sexual you know um, and it's just a teenage girl and they're just they're just dancing the way they've seen people dancing twerking shaking their asses the way people would do in a, in a pop video and she is she, she's mm. this, she's you know simultaneously quite horrified by this but also as well quite envies it because she mm -hmm. envies her own daughter's youth. Yeah. And what she also envies as well is her own daughter's um, freedom. Mm -hmm. Because again, this woman, whenever she was, when she was younger, um, her, um, her brother ended up having a very bad accident that ended up paralyzed, which changed the whole dynamic of their family because the, 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 the um, brother had to be the focal point. Yeah. So much had to be done rightly to support the brother. And so she had to become quite a sensible little kid. And so she sees with her, with her daughter a way of living that she could never really access, even though she really, she really wanted it to. She wanted to access that. Mm. So that's, that's the sort of thing that, that I, like, I like writing about. But kind of as well, the idea that, you know, if we, if we all in this room, we, everybody in this room will have had all sorts of things happen to them. And we've all got our little hopes and dreams and things that didn't quite work out. And other times where we think, we think to ourselves, well, wow, that was a lucky escape. We've all got that. We don't tell people that all of the time. Because what we have to do is just kind of keep going. And so in most of the stories, there's a kind of a top temporal line, mm -hmm. which is maybe just people having a coffee or people, as you say, this is the domestic, Lucy, you know, living at that level. Mm -hmm. But if you dismiss people living at that level as just, oh, ordinary lives, everyday quotidian, you're missing out big time on what a lot of writers are trying to, trying to do. Yeah, um, and I think that idea as well, um, I love that. Wendy, and I think um, I write, there's a short passage in one of my stories about Nell McCafferty um, leading a charge of 30 women into a pub when a woman wasn't allowed to order a pint of Guinness and she ordered um, 30 brandies and a pint of Guinness. Yeah. And um, the barman served all the brandies, um, the woman downed the brandies, he, reserved, he refused to serve the pint of Guinness because that was against the law, and so Nell refused to pay on account of him not fulfilling her order. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, you know, the, so, so it, it's funny, it's a political stunt, it, but you think, okay, so that is the, that is the way that change can happen. Mm. You know, why can't a woman have a pint? Is it because her little hands are too <laughs> small to hold it you know a woman can have two half pints simultaneously you know but so so but it's you, I think that you know you question something like that and it's actually a very very small move onwards to say okay so why can't a woman have a baby when she's not married and stay at home with her family mm -hmm. you know yeah. so you start questioning so again you know you question something um at a very small level and that thread can lead on to the biggest 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 things you know, absolutely. So I think yeah. that that um, that as well. The the that that is a you know, we. The, I suppose the personal is always it cannot be political. Political, absolutely. You know, yeah. Happening to yeah. be the inhabitants of a female body, or yeah. you know, I could mm. substitute that. That is that is. Um, that is political mm. in ways that you don't choose, but you have to reckon with as you move through the world. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and back to ideas of the female body as well and, and your play, Rosemary. And I'd love to, to talk a little bit to the three of you actually just about, about the processes behind some of the recent works. Um, I'm sure you had to do a lot of research uh, for Silent Trade. And, and how did you go about that? Yeah, um, well, because I'd done the previous play, Lives in Translation, I, I had a, or I knew a, a church, basically a mission, Belfast mission, and so he, he knows all the community groups. It's just like you get into the network, and once you're in that network, you can do the research and meet people. And um, yeah, I, I didn't, do you know, you get, sometimes you get so much material from one person, you don't need, you know, I had, I actually only in, uh, had two, two people, but they give me so much information because uh, part of the play is about the brothel and part of the play is also about um, set in a domestic home environment 
we're talking about domestic environments, yeah. 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 And this really is the domestic where you're actually uh, kept on the floor, you sleep on the floor in, in your, uh, I mean, it's just so kind of uh, like 19th century land owner with slave. And this is what is fascinating about that. And because it's in, it could be our next door neighbor doing that and we just don't know because they're told the, the victim is told never to answer the door or raise their head. You know, they're in the kitchen the whole time. They live in the kitchen and that's it. Um, mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so I think, yeah, it was, uh, the research was, yeah. Uh, it's always a pleasure to get those because those are the inside stories of it. And it's just so exciting when you, you get that. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just like, okay, then I can really dramatize something that nobody knows about, you know, and, a, pay, a newspaper won't go into. So that's really what you're trying to go in. Um, there was a guy, one of the guys I talked to, he he had been a brothel buster, believe it or not. He had uh, gone to Germany and, um, or he'd lived in Berlin and he had, uh, there had been so many underage traffic girls. He had gone in into those and researched them and then reported as a, as a client and reported back to the police. So, I mean, it was just, uh, those are sort of extraordinary stories where he's so brave, you know, because uh, so dangerous to do that. And one of the things I really enjoyed about the play as well, though, was the complexity of, of the situation and how, you know, we're not necessarily reassured at the end that there is an easy solution here, you know, so without giving too much away, Precious is that the protagonist situation changes, but we're not necessarily left very confident that there's the system there to care for her now that she's out of this domestic slavery and brothel situation. But where is she going to go? What support is she going to have? She's still very at risk. Um, was that something that kind of frustrated you about the stories of the people that you'd heard? Yeah, well, I, I, I do think that it, it was really, I wanted to show how the police is, is also a kind of abuser using her for, for their... To make a case. To make a case. Yeah. And, he, yeah, so that's what was fascinating about that because mm. she confronts him, really, about that. Yeah, you've used me as well, you know, so yeah. why are you so um, high and mighty? So that, that was the... And, and the undercover thing, I have a policeman who goes undercover in this, and it's that whole... You know, he's getting close emotionally. It's all those boundaries, yeah. which is really fascinating. And that's what I wanted mm. to cover in the play. Um, mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, individuals just getting lost in this kind of chaos. Um, Lucy, I'd love to talk to you a little bit about These Days, which is a stunning novel uh, dealing with the, the history of the Belfast Blitz. And again, just about the process of inhabiting that, because I, I have to say, I hadn't known that much about the Belfast Blitz. Um, and I, I was completely swept away by the narrative and so convinced by this research that is so lightly worn in the novel. I mean, how did you how did you go about Thank approaching you. that? Well, it's funny. This is my first um, historical novel that qualifies by, as the Walter Scott Prize would have it, the Waverley Rules, which is it has to be set sixty years in the past. That's how they judge a historical oh, wow. novel. Okay. Um, but actually, I would I would say um, there were certain elements of the research that I absolutely loved like, um, you know, combing Virginia Woolf's diaries to see where she says looking glass rather than mirror, yes. you know, you ha and, and doing it, if you do that too much, it becomes parody, but sort of getting it tonally right. Mm -hmm. But actually, I would say that, you know, if I'm writing a story set in 2002, you know, you don't write in a sort of generic present, you don't write in a generic past, because you have to ask yourself questions like, um, okay, I always think, what size were the mobile phones that we were using? Yeah. You know, had they got so small that they were like credit cards and then they could get no smaller so they started to get big again? Yeah. Um, you know, did we have Google Maps? Um, did you still go about the city with, you know, an A to Z? Mm. Um, was Uber a thing yet? You know, like the texture of how people are living. Yeah. And I think also if I'm writing Belfast, and I know, you know, this is, this, this is the same, um, Belfast has changed so much. Um, I'm doing a sort of this <laughs> with my hand, <laughs> but you need to know exactly where your story is set. Otherwise, you haven't a hope of yeah. capturing the feeling of it, capturing kind of the fabric of the city, you know, mm. none of that. So I think none of my stories feel um, the, the, the sort of research um, is, is maybe always similar. But for these days, um, it came about when I was living in a flat then in the Docklands in London, um, Victorian warehouse flat. and. Um, everything 
up the street, down the street, this way, that way. Um, everything had been flattened by the London Blitz. Yeah. Um, and my son at the time was, was obsessed with a book called Peepo by Janet oh, and Alan Albert. I love that book. Uh, yeah, here's little baby, one, two, three, yeah. hands in his cup, what's he see? And it's a life in the day of a baby against the London Blitz. And I would read this to him every night for months, thinking how strange it was that in this flat, we would have survived everything the London Blitz had to throw at us. Yeah. Um, but, you know, a meter this way, you know, five meters that way, we, we wouldn't have. And of course, I started thinking about Belfast and thinking of the sort of vagaries of chance and place and being five minutes early or five minutes late or going the way they tell you to run or the other way. Or yeah. And then I started to think, hang on, there was a Belfast Blitz. Mm. Um, there's only one novel. I went to look for it in fiction. There's only one novel by Brian Moore, um, Emperor of Ice Cream, recently reissued by Turnpike. Um, it features a little bit of Mary Beckett's Give Them Stones, but there's, there's almost there's next to no fiction. Um, but it still exists just about within living memory. Yeah. Um, so I started researching and I thought I might get a short story from it. Um, so many of my favourite writers, Elizabeth Bowen, Virginia Woolf, Rosamund Lehman, you know, Henry Green, Sylvia Tanzo Warner, they're all like great writers of the London Blitz. Yeah. And so I thought maybe there'll be a story in the Belfast Blitz. And I started researching and then winter in 2019 tipped over into spring 2020 and COVID started coming closer. And the Belfast Blitz was April to May 1941, which overlaid almost exactly with our first lockdown. And so suddenly it became really urgent to collect these stories of people who were 80, 90, in their hundreds. One woman, 103, I spoke to. Wow. Um, and those are the people we were losing first in the care homes, the elderly. Yeah. Occasionally I'd make an appointment to speak to someone um, and the time would come for the phone call and they would have passed away, you know. So, so it, and people would inevitably say, oh, love, I've got nothing to tell you. <laughs> and then you get them talking and they just have all this extraordinary detail. So I wove all of those stories, but I wrote that first draft of the book so intensely. Um, it felt like the work was staying on the psychic frequency that the book was happening. Mm. And it did feel that if I didn't do that justice, um, the story would go to someone else. Yes. You know, it did feel that, that I had to stay, you know, tuned in and, and, and on that frequency mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and it felt very live to me as I was writing it. Yeah, absolutely. And that urgency is, mm. is really, really there throughout the narrative and, and particular I you know, and I I was trying to figure out a way to talk about We Betty without giving anything away mm -hmm. and I can't really. But for any of you who haven't read the book yet, brace yourselves for that particular moment. Um it's really, really devastating. But also a wonderful a wonderful um exploration of class intersectionality, I think, which is something that, that comes up, I think, in a lot of the books, in, in all of these stories, uh, short stories, the play, uh, the novel, um, you know, the interesting ways in which different classes mix together in a city like Belfast. But before I talk to that, uh, I talk about that, Wendy, I'd love to, to ask you a little bit about your process. Was we were chatting last night and you were mm -hmm. talking about how your short stories often start off as very long stories. Yes, I mean, I am not like, in terms of research, I am a very lazy person. I mean, I, I, I spend a lot of time looking at nonsense on my phone. You know, if you looked at, at makeup reviews, all sorts of things, um, absolute nonsense. So it's not as if I don't have, have, don't have time. Um, I do, because I spend a lot of it looking at nonsense and playing silly games as well. Um, King's, King's Quest and stuff. So, so I, do, I, I do waste a lot of time on that. But when it comes to the stories, I don't really do any research. And this started whenever um, I wrote the first collection. I was working full time, teacher, still, still do that. And I didn't really want to do anything that um, involved me having to spend lots and lots of time involved in, in research. And so... All of my stories were really quite geographically circumscribed. You know, they're all taking place within the same few, within the same few streets. Mm. So there's not research from, from, that, point of, from that point of view. Um, but the way I normally work is that um, the stories I read are probably about 6,000 words or so. That's usually my, my length. But 
I begin by writing a first draft that's really quite long, so maybe treble what I need. So maybe about 18,000 words. And it's actually, I find that really enjoyable because you're writing with no restrictions whatsoever. And at that stage, I don't really know what the story's about. And there's all these people presenting themselves and I just go with it. And, you know, sometimes it might be, nobody could read these things. I mean, they're <laughs> absolutely awful. Sometimes it'll just be bullet points because maybe it's something I can't be bothered going into in any detail just at this point. But um, I, will just, I will just write like that and then I'll read it and read it back in a kind of, so I'm writing in quite a warm way whenever I'm doing that first draft. And it's just going, I suppose, just, just with the heart. And then I need to read it back in quite a cool way and think, what, what's going on here? Is there yeah. anything of interest, you know? So maybe a character that I think is really central is actually really peripheral. And maybe something that I think is, um, you know, just sort of totally inconsequential, that's where the actual interest is. So. Um, that story, Dance Move, we talked about a little bit. Um, I initially thought it was one thing, but it turned out to be something totally different. Um, I initially had another person as the absolute focus. So I work over it again and then go back to the start and do it all over again another couple of times. And it's just like a... It's just like things feel like they're coming into view. You know, if you've got a camera and you're twisting the lens or whatever, and you, you see things just sharpening up and you, you start to realise, right, this is this is what I'm seeing here. So that's that's normally my process. It's not always like that. There's occasionally times when things have just happened quite quickly, but mostly it's that long mm -hmm. first mm -hmm. first draft. Yeah, that sounds quite liberating, actually. It does sound like a, a much more fun way to approach it than it worrying is. about the structure from the outset. It is. I mean, I don't know if people hear right short stories, but one of the things I always find um, really off-putting is the idea that of starting a story. I suppose like a start and an end are the sort of most artificial points mm -hmm. of the story where you're asking somebody to leave their world and enter your world. And there's great pressure at the beginning of the story because you want to make sure that people are into it properly. And sometimes you hear things as well about, oh, it, you know, if you don't write this killer first paragraph, nobody's going to be interested. And that would put anybody off ever beginning um, to write one. <laughs> so I think just, just start where you feel like. And, you know, where you might eventually begin the story might be somewhere totally different to where you initially begin. Yeah. It's going to be a long journey and that's, that's fine. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. You mentioned, though, that the, the, the kind of close geographical focus of the stories. Mm. But in Dance Move, you do take your characters out of Belfast. Yeah, who goes out of Belfast? Let me see. Who, let sell. me see. Sell. Oh, Sal. Yeah. She goes out of Belfast. It's a disaster. It's a cautionary tale. <laughs> and, and it's a cautionary tale. She, yeah. Yeah. She, has to, she has to come back again. In fact, she has to be bailed out by her brother um, <gasps> to get her back yeah, again. Yeah. yeah. I mean, people, people do. And I suppose as well, oh, yes, somebody who doesn't live in Belfast comes to Belfast in nostalgia, in and nostalgia. it's not good. Yeah. Um, yeah. So either stay in so or stay out. Either <laughs> either just stay where you are, or else don't visit. Yes. Oh, brilliant. Well, look, I, we might open up to some questions from the audience at this stage. Um, I don't know if we have a roving mic, um, and I'm kind of staring at. I've got the stage lights kind of glaring at me, but oh, we do, I think. But if you want to put your hand up, anybody? Oh, gorgeous, <laughs> wonderful. Any sure. questions at all? I have more if, if nobody else has, but uh, oh yes, it's just over here. It's so refreshing. Sorry, yeah. I'm not uh, a mic. Ah, oh, grand. Oh. Somebody's coming <laughs> with the mic now. Just one sec. Thank you. Thank you. It's just so refreshing to hear a different voice from Belfast that's not about the troubles. So I'd like to congratulate you all on that. <laughs> And as regards the story about Nell McCafferty, I was in the pub that day. Oh. <laughs> Amazing. I would love to talk to you after. I call it my fight for Irish women's freedom. Yeah. Um, my grant at the time, my parents gave me 10 punts. It was punts in those days. Six of which went to my rent. So I had to make the decision to buy the brandy and the pint, which meant I didn't eat for the rest of the week. <laughs> if anybody of you remembers your student days, I call that my fight for Irish freedom. I have to hand it to the sergeant who came in from the guards. He just turned to the barman and he said, would you feed the women the pints, you silly <laughs> That's what he said. So common sense prevailed in the end. Thank you oh, so that's much. That's brilliant. brilliant. Thank 
you. I think you've made our day. There's another lady. Oh, yeah. There's another lady here. Thanks. I feel a bit compelled to pick up one. That, that's amazing. I feel like I'm sitting beside a superstar. Um, <laughs> um, but just uh, to pick up on the point of, of the previous speaker, it is really nice. I'm a Northern Irish woman myself from Belfast, and it is really nice to hear, um, you know, people writing and thinking about stories that are beyond the dominant narrative of the Troubles and I suppose I'm a bit preoccupied with that myself that I'm wondering as the three of you as writers is there an element of um, you know 25 years on from the Good Friday Agreement there's still an awful lot of healing and reconciliation to happen however I'm wondering is there a freer space to think about these narratives in a different way mm -hmm and a freedom in the voice of particularly female writers to write about things that are, you know, socio-economically and socio-politically really important to the feminist agenda, but heretofore got lost in the, in the, in the massive kind of, you know, a monolith that was the troubles. Yeah, do you know what I would say? Um, I began, I wrote, my, my first novel was published um, almost 20 years ago. I wrote it, I began it when I was at, uni I finished it, I wrote it at university, it was published the year after. And I was writing it in England in um, the year 2000. And there was a sense then that any time I said I was writing a novel set in Northern Ireland, no one was interested. Mm. To, especially after 9-11, when suddenly terrorism was something else, something different. Um, you know, there was, there was the, the feeling then that it was embarrassing that, that this part of the world, this part of the West, had gone through something like that, and there was, peep, there was a feeling um, that that story was in the past. No one cared. No one wants to hear. Mm. What I have found over the course of my writing life is, I think sometimes it takes um, distance. You look at a. I think there is still a lot of room for troubles stories or stories set during the troubles. You look at a masterpiece like Milkman, and you think that that could not have been written. You know. Um, five years after the events, 10 years after the events. That book is the effect of a sort of psychic crucible, you know, that takes time um, to, to be distilled into its perfect form. Or you look at a book that I loved from last year, Louise Kennedy's Trespasses. Mm. Um, again, a troubles novel, and one that she is so brilliant at bringing to life. Um, at one point, a woman uh, wakes up next to her lover, and um, they're having sex, and she smells a scallion -y smell of his armpits, you know? Mm. And that novel, it brings to life so viscerally and so bodily, uh, the, the experience of being a person in that place at mm. that time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's room for that. If you look at, um, not just women, I think there are, the problem with um, talking about, you know, a troubles narrative is we tend to talk in terms of binaries, we tend mm. to talk in terms of narratives that have ossified. And actually, I think um, the, the more stories we have from so many different voices, the richer the whole tapestry becomes. You know, there's a writer that I'm, I'm mentoring and um, she came over from, she's Muslim, came over from um, India when she was two years old, um, grew up in Lurgan. And I am desperate for, and she always felt for years, she's married, lives in Northern Ireland, has a more Northern Irish accent than, than I do, um, raised children. I want to know where is the story of celebrating Eid and Lurgan in 1987? Mm. You know, that story, there, there are so many stories that, that we're missing. And so I would say that I think there is room for other stories and different stories and various stories and contradictory stories simultaneously. And also I think the troubles is still something that is, we have never had a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Mm. You see the way narratives start changing uh, and the way new generations interpret things differently. And you think there isn't a point at which you say, okay, that's it, we've had the trouble stories, let's have something else. Mm. Yeah, though I, I would say that there are, t the troubles narratives are too much in vogue right now. I, I have felt that myself. And I mean, troubles are interesting. I mean, I use them myself to kind of reflect the difference between the past and present. I mean, it is interesting, but, but it's too much of a vogue right now. And I do think there should be more room. I, I think publishers are in danger of just saying, this is what we want, this defines Belfast, and I don't like that at all. It shouldn't be, we, we have so much, so, like you say, the Eid story and everything, yeah. We're so much more diverse than the, that. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I think as for any writer, um, 
you, if, you want, if you want to write a story, if you're from Belfast or you know, you're from Lurgan or whatever and you want to write a story about doors, then that's what you should do. If you want to write a story about the troubles, then that's what you should do. Um, disregarding any kind of other commercial imperatives or, or, or whatever else. Um, I mean, I just, I just agree that what we need are diversity, plurality of, of stories, you know? And the idea, I think, sometimes comes across um, that there was this sort of homogenous troubles experience, and that's absolutely just not the case because it's going to have been so place-specific and also as well quite class-specific, you know, yeah. that you had, you know, particular areas that were, that were, that were much disproportionately affected by, by the troubles than, than, than other places. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea even that, um, you know, people from the same community but of different classes. You know, what necessarily does um, a, a woman, um, a Catholic woman in the 70s, um, living on, on the Malone Road, um, you know, in, in great affluence, what, does, what necessarily does she have in common with somebody from the same background who's living on a very, very tough estate? So, you know, it's kind of looking at the complexities of people's, um, of people's existences mm -hmm. yeah. um, now, and, uh, now and then. And, and there are some really interesting new voices emerging as well of a younger generation who didn't, who grew up kind of post Good Friday mm -hmm. agreement, but are still living with the effects of what their parents and what their grandparents went through, which is... Yeah, really transgenerational mm -hmm. trauma. Oh, we love it. Word. Yeah. We love it. Yeah. <laughs> Any yeah. academics go mad for yeah. that. <laughs> Epige the epigenetic stuff. Yeah, absolutely. But it is interesting. I mean, people like the poet uh, J.C. Patterson and, and Michael McGee as well. You know, there is, there is the shadow of, of all of that there in the background. Um, but yes, I think it is maybe transcendering... Tr trans mm -hmm. Transcending? Mm -hmm. Transcendering? Transcending those kind of old binary, you know, uh, mm. those representations which were very simplistic. Well, I mean, I think the response to Michael McGee's novel has been just, I find it just so incredibly encouraging because to me it just seems such an incredibly um, nuanced presentation of, of, a, of a life. Mm. And the fact that this can be really, really widely appreciated as of, as of worth, mm. um, I, I just find really encouraging. Yeah, yeah, yeah. fantastic. I think we probably have time for another question. Uh, this person over here, thank you. It's kind of more of a comment rather than a question, but your discussion about the fact that uh, it's now more, uh, it's, they're now open to talking about uh, having dramas and, uh, um, and um, books about Northern Ireland during the Troubles as such, because it's more cool to do it now. It wasn't really acceptable, not acceptable, but Someone like Adrian McKinty, the Northern Irish writer, uh, he's had a lot of books about some uh, policeman uh, based in Belfast in the 1980s or so, and he was told at the time, no one wants to hear about a policeman in Northern Ireland, this is not going to happen. Mm -hmm. And he's now, only now, reissuing um, re them. They're all now become popular because it's of a time. The same with something like Derry Girls, which came a bit after. We were work, working with Charabang Theatre Company, you may remember, in Belfast, doing a lot of plays about the Troubles with an awful lot of humour, great wit, as you have in Belfast, which is absolutely stunning. And a lot of the jokes we were using or were in Derry Girls, if you know what I mean. And I remember thinking, why didn't someone pick up on it then when we were doing it? And actually, as it turns out, it wasn't right. You need the time for it to pass so you can look back at a troubled place and then look at it historically, I think. I, I don't know if you believe that or not in the yeah, sense that... Tra trauma fatigue, yeah. I think, it happens, mm. and yeah, it, it does. But these things, yeah, I mean, I remember in theatre, you were told sort of the beginning, I think it was somebody like Dan Gordon saying, oh, God, not another Troubles play, you know? So it, it was, that was about 2006 around then. Yeah. So it was too close, it was just too close. And now, yeah, it, it come, they come up all the time. I mean, I think... Um, David Ireland, Cypress Avenue, for instance, you know, I mean, huge, huge hit. So, you know, it's, yeah, it's just cyclical, and, and that's all you can say. But I hope this cycle doesn't last too long and we go sort of into other things, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, and continuing with the nuance and, and kind of breaking down those binaries. Um, I think that's, oh, there's one more question. We can definitely fit in one more. Hi, just similar to the last, I, I think it's more common than question, but firstly, um, and having worked in the area of immigration law, I would say that the people who experience 
and end up here as trafficked persons or people who are escaping troubles, be they mm. in their own nation, state, or personal lives. So I'd say, firstly, there's troubles <laughs> inherently there. And secondly, as a comment, um, things may be cyclical, and I would, I'm, not, I'm not challenging that. I'm just saying my experience of um, diversity and diversity in, in work and diversity in representation and, and in people's stories, women's stories, but I'd be much more interested in, I like Wendy's approach that I don't think things are gender specific, mm -hmm. even if it's really important to keep the focus on women and f whatever else. <laughs> but I, I think things are very, are much less gender specific than maybe the media would or society. So my, my point would be, surely, or how would you feel about there's such an overwhelming body of material at all times for any one person in any one place on the globe that life is evolving. Therefore, while the media or it may seem that the troubles, you know, has been intrinsically linked to Belfast, my point would be the beauty is in, in, in the detail because every single place has a, a marriage of stories. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I just think that while something may feel cyclical, that may be the focus of the, I don't know, the publishing companies or the media, yeah. but the reality is everyone, including the trafficked women, have phenomenal stories. Mm. And would the, people, would the writers agree with that? Yeah, I mean, on the trafficked women theme, yeah, uh, I mean, uh, the, yeah, the, the character of Precious is really her, her background, the impoverishedness, forced marriage, um, female mutilation. All of the genital mutilation and things like that. I mean, there's so many traumas and things that are huge that are in Belfast now that, as you say, it's almost like a troubles within a troubles kind of thing. And we always, always thought in Belfast that it's the kind of thing that maybe people are attracted to Belfast because of the troubles, uh, troubled people. Maybe there's something there as well. Like we talk about transgenerational trauma, maybe a city of troubles attracts troubled people. And I don't know, that's just an idea that I'm throwing out, but mm. I haven't thought about that quite through. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think some of the best advice I've ever had on writing came from a theatre director, Ian Rickson, and he said, um, there's no such thing as a minor character. Mm. You know, if you have a character whose only job is to walk on stage and feed a line to another character, you know, think again, we should know watching a play that even if someone is only on that play for, you know, a line or two lines or no lines at all, that if things were tilted slightly, the whole drama could be from their perspective. And I know this is something that Wendy will agree with, you know, there's no such thing. What, what is an ordinary person? You know, there's yeah. no such thing as an ordinary life. And that's a thing that, that has always fascinated me as a writer, that, you know, you can meet someone, you can get to know them quite well, maybe as a friend, maybe as a lover, and there still might be like chambers and chambers and chambers that you don't have access to of people's hopes, their longings and their secrets and their fears and their past and their, and there's, you know, there's no such thing as an, an ordinary or a minor person or character or story, I think. Mm. I couldn't agree more. I mean, I, I, I think that's such good advice that nobody, people shouldn't be minor characters because we all think we're center stage. Nobody's going to go, I'm a bit player and like, you know, <laughs> we, we all think that we're, that we're central. And mm. I think as well, the whole idea of writing about the troubles, what do we even mean by that? You know, mm. You could have a spectrum where at the one end you've got, you know, man walks into bar, shoots person, you know, bomb, whatever, right? But then you look at the sort of deep structure of a place and how even when you're thinking that you're not affected, you maybe are. So, you know, I've got a character who just doesn't like green sweets. She, she always would not eat the green sweet. You know, and that's because of her particular prejudice. So she's terribly nice, quite a middle class, terribly pleasant person, you know, who wouldn't profess to be sectarian really, but she doesn't like a green sweet. And she also <laughs> she also does not like she's got a there's a mug that somebody gave her, but she's got a particular type of um, font, a typeface that looks more Irish as far as she's concerned, and she doesn't really use that mug so much. So, so that's, I'm not putting those things, they are kind of funny, but I'm not putting them in to be, to be really funny, you know? It's part of a deep structure of a society mm -hmm. that has been, has been polarised. Yeah, and we're right back to those, how telling those, the tiniest yeah. mm -hmm. little details. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And I think those deep structures are something that you all 
tackle with such skill in your work and, and just bring to the surface for us for these wonderful fleeting glimpses. So on that end, I'd like to ask you all just to thank our wonderful thank you, thank you. And thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.